Brothers and sisters, today we celebrate All Saints Day. Now the logic of All Saints Day is that there were so many martyrs in the early centuries of Christian history, of whom we know many by name, but there were so many others who we didn't get to find out their name, but we know were persecuted, even to the point of death. And so the early church decides that we should honour these people. We should show that um, honour and respect to these people so that they're not forgotten. And though we might not know their names, God does. And so, although initially All Saints Day was an All Martyrs Day, an All Martyrs Day, people who um, paid with their life for their faith in God, it then developed into a umbrella festival covering all types of saints, not just the martyrs. So we've said that martyrs are those who witness to the faith. In fact, the Greek word martis means witness. And by witnessing, we normally mean someone who vouches for the truth, i.e. with words or with actions, perhaps. It is in Christian history that the word martyr takes on that extra meaning of witnessing to the truth to the point of death. And so that, that is why in English, martyr means to the point of death. But in Greek, martis can mean both. It can mean we're just witnessing, generally, and in fact in a court case, even the modern Greek word is still martis for witness, um, as well as martyrdom. Then there are other saints, other groupings of saints, other characteristics of sainthood. Now those of us who haven't really thought about the definition of sainthood, are often led by an assumption. An assumption that we have that, oh, someone who becomes a saint is someone who was perfect. And that leads them into another rabbit hole, which is, well, if they were perfect, and then we read a bit of history, and we see that some people who were honoured as saints, lived as human beings like us and made mistakes, said things which they may not, or they may, should not have said, or were kings and emperors who wielded authority and sometimes authority to the point of imposition. And then, we, then it doesn't stack up in our mind. Well, how can someone perfect be a saint? And, and what's this business of the church naming people saints who aren't perfect? Well, whoever said the definition of sainthood is perfection? So let's go one step back. Let's define this. Let us understand the word agios, which is the Greek word for saint, and the word used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament for saint. What does Aegeos mean? Does it mean perfect? Perfect is Telios. Telios is the word for perfect. What's Aegeos? Aegeos means special, stand out, an example to all of us. May not have been perfect, but still an example, still an ideal for us all, something we can learn from. They stood out from the crowd. They weren't normal, you know what I mean? They, they stood out with their characteristics, character and achievements, spiritual achievements. Well, that's better. Well, now we can understand why certain people were defined as saints through the history of the church and why there are different categories of saints. So we've talked about the martyrs, people who are willing to give their blood for the faith. 
Then there are the apostles. If you look at this icon here of the Last Supper, the disciples became the apostles after the Pentecost. An apostle means messenger or missionary or preacher, someone who spreads the word. And so they're in a grouping of, of their own. All of them except once, and John the Evangelist, were martyred as well. So they cover two groups. They were both martyrs and apostles. But St John the Evangelist is not a martyr, but he's an evangelist. You see, that's another epithet, another descriptor of a saint. He wrote one of the Gospels, Evangelist, Evangelium. Another category of saints is the fathers and the mothers of the church. They are people who were the scholars, the people who were able to articulate, think about and package the faith in such a way that they could explain it for their time and by extension for our benefit through the ages. And so when you read the Church Fathers, for example, it is almost always deep theological, meaningful work impactful, profound. The martyrs may not have been able to write a book. Yes, they gave their life and their blood, but the church fathers had that characteristic, that they were able to encapsulate and explain and interpret for our benefit the Bible and the rest of the tradition of the church. That's the church fathers. Then we've got all the ascetics, ascites. Ascesis in Greek means exercise, applying discipline to yourself. And the ascetics are the monks and the nuns, people who are athletes in the spiritual life, people who stand out in a different way. And they give up property, they give up money, they give up the opportunity to have a family even, and they go and live in the wilderness. Some as hermits, some living in caves, some living in huts, and then others again in small communities, helping each other in this spiritual journey. Now all these categories of saints go back to one of to, to today's passage and gospel reading. And I remember once watching a, a YouTube video which was uh, created by an atheist and he quoted this passage. It was this passage that he quoted to prove why someone shouldn't be a Christian. If this passage were that bad, we wouldn't read it in church. But we read it once a year. It comes around to be read once a year. And it's a powerful message. So bear with me. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, said Jesus. What an interesting thing to say. Gee, that's demanding. And our atheist friends would look at that and say, see, that's why you shouldn't follow Jesus. Because your first love in life should be your family. Jesus makes a very good point. And he often uses strong language, exaggerated language even, in order to make a point. And if we can't see between the lines that he's trying to make a point, then we're missing that point. He doesn't say, don't love your father and your mother and your son and your daughter and children and property and so on. He says, those who put those above God are not worthy of me. And that stands to reason, doesn't it, suddenly? Because if you were to put everything else, which every other nation and every other person puts first in life, and there is no spiritual bearing on your life, 
Forget about being judged worthy of being a Christian, but I would argue that there's an imbalance in life and people find out the hard way. If you were to put God first, that does not mean that you absolutely diminish family to the point of zero. That's not what this is saying. That's saying that if you put God first, family second, you are actually pulling up family. You see that? Priority. But with that priority, you are lifting your relationship with your family. If there is no God in your life, if there is no spiritual balance in your life, then even your love of family can crash and collapse. Even your love of property and land can be meaningless. So it's a question of priority. So therefore, my dear friends, the price, the price of being Christian is to understand that we have to prioritise our life in that order. God first, family second, and everything else follows. Doesn't mean it doesn't come, it comes, but put them in the right order. Insofar as the saints are concerned, so I can bring this full circle now, here we have examples. It's one thing for us to quote a high ideal that Jesus places for us, and quite another to see the saints' lives which put this into practice. We have 2,000 years of examples. The martyrs, the church fathers and mothers, the apostles, even kings and queens achieved sainthood by being close to the Spirit and having the Spirit guide their life. So many examples of kings and queens which you would think, kings and queens, politicians, people in authority, they can't possibly achieve sainthood. You would only say that if you didn't know their life. You would only dismiss their life if you didn't know the details of their life. And there are any number of kings, queens and emperors, not all of them of course, a small minority, but any number who can inspire us. Because all of us really, in this day and age, 2020, are kings and queens. The level of our um, quality of life, I would say is even higher than kings and queens of the past. We live in the middle class, even poor people, live better than kings and queens of the past. If you were to think about the comforts and technology that we have in this day and age. And so therefore for us who are kings and queens, let me say that, we can even look up to them and see how even people with wealth and authority were able to turn that around and achieve humble sainthood. So dear friends, All Saints Day. That means we're all celebrating today because all of us are named after one saint or another and especially those who may be named after uh, a name or have, were given a name which has no patron saint. We like to have patron saints in the choosing of the names of our children. But in the, in the situation that people do not have uh, a saint um, who they're named after, this is the day you may celebrate all together as a family of both the living and those who have gone before us. Amen.